What is it about our brains that makes us think the way we do? What is it about our brains that makes us smart? Somewhere in this really intricate circuit uh, that we call the human brain, there's something about it that makes us smart and makes us able to, to solve problems. My lab is trying to tackle this question with a number of different paradigms, many of which are in the domain of um, social cognition. Our sociality and that of many primates is of course rooted in that of other mammals. So we share a lot of these properties with other mammals, but primates are a special kind of social. And you can see this here in this movie of Tonky and Macaques, which most of you will never have seen, but you will understand sort of the little social drama that's unfolding here, um, where literally these lives of these animals are revolving around each other. So they're very visual. Um, they are signaling actively to each other. And it's thought that this would be one factor or maybe the dominant factor that made primates smart. The alternative hypothesis is shown here. Someone just invented a nose pick. And so the alternative hypothesis to how um, primates got smart is that because of the elevated dexterity that primates have compared to other animals, because of hands and then eventually an opposable thumb, that they can manipulate the environment much more. And so therefore, you know, use little tools like this one here. So it's anyone's guess at this point, you know, did we become smart because we had to compete with others and outsmart others in a complex social environment or because we are able to manipulate our environment more. I would just like to give you one illustration of how smart other primates are. This is a story of, um, of one particular monkey, a baboon by the name of Ala. Um, and the story is, um, is this, she was a, um, a herding animal in Southwest Africa at the time. Many farmers would not use dogs to herd uh, their goats, but they used uh, baboons. And so Ala was basically transplanted from a baboon environment into this farming environment where now her social world uh, consisted of goats. And she would adopt some behaviors that goats would have, like you see her here. None of these pictures are really good and I apologize for that, but you might be seeing her here um, at this place where she's licking uh, a salt stone. This is not a behavior that baboons would normally engage in, but goats would engage in. But she would also keep behaviors that are typical for baboons. Like you can see her here, uh, grooming goats. Obviously goats are not able to groom each other. Um, because they lack hands, but Ala would now, you know, being true to her baboon nature, she would now groom her, the members of a new social environment. But she would also do something else that was really smart and was really not encouraged by the farmers at all. At the end of the day, when the farmers brought back the animals, they would separate the yinlings from the adult animals. So yinlings would go in one stable, adult animals into another. And Ala would not have this. You can see her here carrying a yinling. And at the end of every day, she would go pick a yinling and pair it up with its mother, go back, pick another yinling, pair it up with its mother, and so on and so forth. The farmers did not want this to happen. They would even beat her. The farmers would also not be able to do it because they didn't know like which yinling belonged to which mother. But for Ala, this was her world. She knew exactly which yinling belonged to which mother. And in her understanding of a social world, yinlings belonged to their mother. They would not be separated. And so she had to act on, if you want, this social norm that was ingrained in her brain. It's an incredibly smart behavior because it means that she must have had a very detailed understanding of a social environment. I learned about the story from this book, Baboon Metaphysics of the late Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seifert, which I greatly recommend to all of you if you're interested in um, the basis of intelligence and primates. Um, they've been studying baboon monkeys for several decades and you know, knew them individually and have intricate knowledge from their field work about what these primates know and what they don't know. Both are very fascinating. So Chini and Seifert and other primate ethologists said that there's a structure to primate social knowledge. At the basis, there's the knowledge of other individuals. Um, of their status in the group, like their age and gender and so forth. There's a second level of understanding, which is the understanding of interactions between these individuals. That is like understanding that they're grooming each other, that they're mothering and so on and so forth. And based on these two levels of understanding, the, the individual and the interactions of the individuals, primates build knowledge of the relationships between individuals, if you want, of the structure of the social world with concepts like kinship, 
friendship, and hierarchy. What I find really intriguing about this last level of processing is that it requires data structures in the brain somewhere that are not just associative, but that they have a structure to them. Once you draw a graph to represent it, there's a directionality to it. If A is the mother of B, B is not the mother of A, but B is the daughter of A or the son. And so if you have this understanding, there must be something really fascinating going on in the neural networks of your brain and eventually want to crack the codes of all of these levels of understanding. Today, I will focus on our standing um, of this person concept and more specifically of the perceptual basis of this uh, person concept, because we get a lot of information about other people and especially other people we know from looking at their faces. So information that we get from faces include, but are not limited uh, to identity, gender, age, race, species, similarity, attractiveness, trustworthiness, I should emphasize just perceived trustworthiness, not actual trustworthiness, mood and attention. So these are pretty elaborate pieces of information that you get in a fraction of a second just by looking at this picture. And you cannot even stop yourself from forming these opinions, if you will, about other individuals when you see uh, their faces. Just briefly, this is not something that is easy for everyone to do. There is about 1% of the general population suffering from a condition known as face blindness or prosopagnosia. To them, the social world looks a bit like here the cover of the fifth season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. All the faces look alike or very similar to each other. They're very difficult to tell apart. All of us have been in environments where people are wearing masks, might have some appreciation of how difficult it can be um, once you don't have full exposure to the face. But in case of prosopagnosia, this can go really as far as having difficulties recognizing your loved ones. These limitations exist, however, in all of us. And I would just like to run a test, like if you want something like an eyewitness identification test on all of you, I will show you a slide with 40 images of faces. They're all front view faces. And I will ask you to uh, infer how many different people are shown in these 40 different images. I'll give you about 10, 10 seconds to look at the images and will then ask you afterwards to tell me um, how many you've seen or you know, if you can tell me, um, just keep it in your mind. So here we go, 40 images of faces. How many people are in there? Someone says four, someone says two, two, okay. two, three. Okay. Okay, so this is, uh, this is astonishing. So in the actual psychophysical study, subjects said had a, a mode of 7.5 um, different individuals that they saw, but you are closer to truth or even right on um, saying two because they're really only pictures of two individuals. I'm highlighting here the pictures of one individual by green outlines and the other one are not outlined. It's really only two different people. So those of you who said two, um, I don't know, congratulations. Either your face recognition abilities are exceptional, in which case we want to hear from you because we're interested in super recognizers, or you might have seen this before, um, or it was like a guess, I don't know. But in a psychophysical study, on average, people said more than seven different um, people in here. And you can see some of the difficulties that have to do you know, with invariant recognition. There's changing of lighting conditions. There are a few changes in age, not really dramatic some changes in, in hairstyle that can really influence your judgment and some changes in facial expression. But most of these pictures, you know, they're pretty similar in size. They're um, all similar in orientation. So they're not really pushing your face recognition abilities to the limit. So let's just go through it. Like, like what do you need to do in order to recognize a face? So the first thing is to detect a face, to be able to know that there is a face and where it is. Um, I'm illustrating this here, this picture from The Godfather, where you can see faces that are not very well illuminated. You can still detect them, no problem. They are at different orientations, they're different distances, still no problem detecting these faces. So face detection is the first and most fundamental process that you need to do to get any information from faces. But there's more happening, and let's focus on identity. If you look at these two images, they are very similar to each other on a pixel by pixel basis, but you might realize that these are pictures of two different individuals. While these two images are rather different on a pixel uh, to pixel basis, but they belong to the same individual. So for us to recognize a person in an image, 
we have to do something perceptually like this, where we're grouping physically dissimilar images together based on identity. And that process is called face discrimination. So we, being neuroscientists, we'd like to know like how is the brain accomplishing this feat? And the answer really goes back to the late Charles Gross, who was the first to record from face selective neurons. You see here one cell responding to the presentation of a monkey face, it did not respond to controls. And he and others found face selective cells like this one throughout this part of the brain that you probably heard about in the course uh, already, which is called inferior temporal cortex. Every symbol here is marking a location where Charles and others had found face selective cells. He started these investigations in the late 1960s. It was very difficult for him to document his findings because papers at the time were written, you know, just descriptively, like what was done, what was found. There was no way to show any direct evidence, like in this image here, which is, you know, from almost 20 years later. So then Nancy Kamersha comes along. I don't know if Nancy already talked to you. She discovered with fMRI in the human brain regions, and first one region, the fusiform face area, that respond significantly more to faces than to non-face objects. And so this really created um, a great excitement um, about being able to understand the organization of the primate and the human brain at this level, you know, of millimeters and centimeters, that there's a functional organization, that maybe there's some logic to this functional organization. Um, yet there are several questions that fMRI cannot answer. So what is really happening when you see, you know, a thresholded T statistic over the entire brain? Is it just the tip of the iceberg you're seeing, or is this really evidence that there is an area of the brain that is devoted to the processing of faces? And second, how do you square this with the picture uh, from electrophysiology macaque monkeys, where you do have ground truth, where you, you know, where different people found cells that were convincingly shown to be face selective, yet they seem to be distributed and not clustered into particular regions. So. While I was in Cambridge teaming up with Doris Tsao at the time, we performed fMRI experiments on macaque monkeys, showing to them pictures of faces and pictures of non-face objects, and finding in macaque monkeys, as I'm showing here in this computer-inflated um, map <clears throat> of one macaque monkey's right hemisphere, six regions shown in yellow and red that responded significantly more to faces than to non-face objects, which are dispersed, but dispersed at specific locations inside this blue area in which um, there are responses that are bigger to non-face objects than to, uh, than to faces. We find these six areas in both hemispheres, so there are 12 in total. Because they're at such reproducible locations, we can give names to them because we can find them back in different individuals. Um, and now we can actually combine these two approaches, the Kamersha approach of doing fMRI with a gross approach of targeting um, single cells, and now targeting single cells inside these face selective areas. I will show you uh, some videos. I will start with a video that Doris and I took of the first uh, recording that we took of a cell inside what we call these middle face patches. And you will hear the activity of the cell. You will also hear some clicks in the background, which are uh, which is the solenoid of the juice reward. But most of the thing you're gonna, things you're going to hear are going to be the action potentials of the cells that's firing. And you're going to see the images that were shown at the same time. You also see like a little black square. I should say this is uh, not something that the animal saw at the time. It's just indicating where the animal was looking. And it's something for us uh, on the control monitor to see. So here we go. So I hope you can convince yourself that every time there's a face shown, that there is a response of the cell. So the cell is very good detecting faces. It's not perfect because sometimes it's also responding to a non-face object, but those responses are more weak than those two faces. So this is uh, one fundamental finding that we um, made across many, many recordings from these face selective areas. I'm showing here on the left-hand side, um, the results of um, many experiments from 280, 
three cells sorted here from top to bottom presented with 96 different images and the 16 face images on the left hand side. You can see that the vast majority of cells are selectively enhanced by faces and a smaller proportion is selectively suppressed. So because of this and um, because we find these face areas in stereotypical locations across individuals and because of the third finding that if we inactivate only one out of these two times six different face areas, we can impair the most fundamental face processing step, which is face detection, as if now the visibility of a face and clutter was reduced from something like this to something like this. Because of these findings, we are proposing that these middle face areas are face processing modules. The term module in cognitive science is very loaded. It has sort of 12 or more different features attached to it. What we mean is a little less ambitious, but still a very strong statement to be tested in future experiments. What we're saying is that this area is there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to process faces. And one of these processes that is performing, we think it's performing face detection via shape analysis. And because of that, we are forced to see faces and things that are not faces. So I really like these peppers. You know, they've just been sliced in half, so they have reason to be unhappy. Uh, they have reasons to lose their teeth. Uh, we know that they're peppers that are not faces, but we cannot not see them as faces at the same time. So it appears that our face processing system is really making an effort to try to find faces in the outside environment. Sometimes it will make mistakes like here, but it's probably safer um, to make a mistake to see a face in the pepper than to miss a face um, you know, when there's partial evidence for it and um, you would miss it. On a practical note, what this finding meant, so the finding that virtually all the cells inside these fMRI identified face areas are in one way or another face selective. This means that we now have unprecedented access to a functionally homogeneous cell population coding for one high level object category. And that is really important to do um, very fine grained, very detailed, very mechanistic experiments to really understand face recognition at a mechanistic level and also to extract the computational principle, something I will talk about later. So um, we are able to record from these face selective cells. We've um, inside these face areas, we find that, that they are very face selective, but why are they very face selective? Or what are they doing with faces? So one of the first questions we asked was the fundamental one in face recognition, and that is about the relationship of the part and the whole. So it's long been shown that at least in the case of familiar faces, you're able to recognize them even when they're highly blurred. Like I'm showing an image here of Woody Allen on the right, highly blurred, if you know him, you will recognize him. At the same time, you can also recognize individual face parts. You know, if you focus on it, you can tell, you know, whether the person has a big nose or, you know, um, if their eyes are close together, far apart, things like this. And so what is the relationship between these two and can we find potential neural mechanisms that could explain uh, these two abilities, the processing of parts and the integration to a whole. So to do this, what we did was um, to generate cartoon stimuli that consisted of very simple geometric shapes. Uh, we confirmed that the cells in the middle face areas that respond to them um, on average 83% as much as to the real faces um, that we showed before, shown here at the top. But what these cartoon stimuli allowed us to do amongst other things was to parameterize a face space. So we could change aspect ratio, for example, from a very flat Ernie like uh, face on the left hand side to a very narrow bird like face on the right hand side. We could change the pupil size from an absent pupil on the left to a very big pupil on the right. We could change relational features like the inter-eye distance from an almost cyclopean arrangement on the left hand side to the eyes far apart from each other and spreading the outside of the face. So you will notice that some of these features are really extreme. You will never see a face that flat as shown on the left hand side or as narrow as on the right hand side. And we did this on purpose to, to really get an extensive map of the face space. We could then alter all of these 19 different face dimensions randomly. Each dimension could have 11 different states. And this is how the stimulus looked like. It looks a bit like a cartoon character trying to talk to you, but really all we're doing is to update about every 100 milliseconds or so, um, the physical parameters of these 19 different face dimensions. And then because we're recording a cell at the same time, we can ask, does the firing of the cell 
depend on the variation along one dimension, independently of all the other 18 dimensions? Then does it depend on the second dimension, independent of all the others, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so forth? So we're basically constructing by a reverse correlation procedure, 19 different tuning curves, 19 tuning curves for each dimension one. Of course, we can ask higher order question, but um, this is the first order question to ask. And in this example cell, yes, the cell showed systematic dependence that on all of these features, but on four of them. So this cell didn't like an urny shaped flat face. It liked a narrow bird like face. It liked the eyes close together in the cyclopean arrangement, not far apart. It liked uh, a, a, a wide eye aspect ratio, and it liked big irises in the narrow ones. So these are the four out of the 19 dimensions that this cell was selected for, that it was tuned to. And you can already see something peculiar about these tuning curves and that they appear to be ramp shaped. So the maximum respond is in one end, the minimum respond is at the opposite end, and the other responses are in between. So this is a rather convenient way of coding things. It's almost like a cell would measure a feature and then relay this, its properties in a one-to-one -one fashion. Now, how does it relate to the coding of actual faces? So once we found that these cells have these broad ram-shaped tuning curves, we wanted to compare it you know, to their tuning to, to human faces. And so we measured the same features and I'm uh, illustrating this here for the uh, case of face aspect ratio also for human faces shown at the bottom, the range of natural human faces for any physical property is very small. And I was very surprised when I did these measurements, all our faces are physically very, very similar to each other. The range that we tested with these cartoons was, was far beyond the range of human faces. But still, if you looked at the population response, here are 15 faces that preferred urny shaped faces on the left-hand side over bird shaped faces on the right-hand side they show a similar tuning, a similar ramp-shaped tuning in this much smaller uh, human face space. So we can explain the tuning of these cells to this parameter, but also to other parameters uh, that are prominent in the population. So what does this mean for how faces are encoded? There are different possibilities of how you could think that faces might be encoded. If you are looking at different faces, and I'm just illustrating this here with a morph on one face of March Livingston, we might recognize um, to another person on the right-hand side, you could imagine an exemplar-based code, which was popular in thinking about coding of faces, where you would have neurons you know, with different tuning widths, but responding to different um, faces and maximally tuned to different faces. It's kind of like a labeled line code or an exemplar-based model. Or you could imagine an access model in which cells have very broad tuning curves, and you might have pairs of cells with opposite tuning inhibiting each other. And um, this way you could easily encode um, in like multiple properties as well. What we found is very, very strong evidence for the access based model and against the exemplar based model. Um, because the tuning curves that we find are both very, very wide, you know, far beyond the human face space. Um, and because they're ram shaped and because we find examples of, you know, opponents um, tuning, you know, either cells, some cells like Orny, others are uh, like Bird. What this means is that you can represent faces in a way that is similar to colors. It's more high dimensional than colors, but the principle is very similar. You can sort these faces based on the physical features. And if you were to adapt to the average face over some period of time, um, or uh, sorry, to an, um, to an extreme face in the near probe, with the average face, your perception of that average face is going to be shifted in the opposite direction, which is evidence for access based coding and for you know, this opponent uh, suppression. So we have evidence for face space. This is a way that these cells can encode facial features. So what about the facial hole? So in several instances, we were able to run a follow-up experiment in which we were, um, after we extracted the preferred feature presenting a modulation of just this feature inside the face. So instead of varying all the 19 different dimensions, we would only vary one. And we would do this either inside the face or without the face present. I'm gonna show you one video to illustrate what, what happened here. So 
So this cell actually likes more lies, but as you can hear now, it requires the context of the whole face. It's not gonna to respond to the, to the eyes when they are presented in isolation. So there's a very strong context modulation by the context of the face. We can determine a tuning curve. I'm showing this here. I'm always going to use warm colors, by the way, for response enhancement and cold colors like blue for response suppression. In this case, we have the feature running from top to bottom and time from left to right. And we have a very nice tuning curve if this relevant feature is presented inside the whole face, but not when it's presented outside. So, and this gave rise to a fundamental insight about how parts and holes might be coded in the middle face patches. There is a measurement of individual facial features in form of these ram shaped tuning curves. And there is a gain modulation by the context of the rest of the face. If you want the features are helping each other to become better versions of themselves. So in the middle face patches, we already have major capabilities of any face processing system, any computational face processing system implemented. We have mechanisms for face detection. I didn't really talk about this, this is a separate study. Um, we have encoding of facial features and we have encoding of configurations. The system also exhibits several core characteristics of human face perception. I talked about evidence for a face space in this opponent coding. I could allude to briefly to the caricature effect. Um, that is the observation that sometimes you're having an easier time recognizing people from exaggerated cartoons of the faces and their actual faces. And this preponderance of cells being particularly sensitive to the extremes of face stimuli that are outside of the normal range of, of human faces is a, a very natural way to, um, to, to generate this effect. There's an inversion effect that we have a harder time recognizing faces when they're turned upside down. We find this also in cartoon faces that now there's less tuning to the features and there's confusion about uh, features that does not exist for upright faces. And there's a part whole effect that I mentioned that the tuning is stronger when you have a, a, a feature that is part of a whole face. It's a surprising effect in human face perception that you're better discriminating a particular feature when you don't show it in isolation, but show it in the context of a whole face. I find this very surprising because you might assume that the other facial features, you know, would, would bias your perception of this, of, of the feature of interest, but instead they're improving it. Now, the system that I described to you in the very beginning that we found with fMRI consists of more than one face area. I told you there are six on either side, but all of the physiology I've shown to you was from the middle face patches, ML and MF. So what about the other face areas? You know, aren't we done? Isn't everything all good? I told you that you know a lot of principles of face processing already exhibited in this middle face patch um, that it can also explain a lot of human psychophysics. What else is going on elsewhere? Well, some things stay the same. So in all of the face areas, practically all the cells are face selected. But the way the different face areas are encoding faces really varies fundamentally and in qualitative ways from one face area to the next. So I'm gonna show you one example here from uh, another face area called AL. And I think it's gonna be straightforward for you to, to figure out like what's going on here with this, with this cell. So this cell exhibits a very peculiar property. It's responding only to profile views of faces. It doesn't even matter which face is shown. It's only responding to the profile, and it doesn't care if it's a left profile or right profile. So that is something that we don't find in the middle face patches, but we find here in, in AL. And I'm going to come back to, to this later. And then if we go to face area AM, we find yet another property that we did not find in the middle face patches. And I would like to illustrate this here. You recognize the cell is firing much more sparsely. And if you pay close attention, you might recognize that it's only responding to one particular individual. There's one blonde boy in here. This guy, and it's practically only responding to image of this one person. So there are a lot of properties of the face processing system that in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into great details of, but 
Um, the things I would like you to take away from, from this so far is that there are multiple face areas, uh, six of them, that each of them has a unique code for faces. Each of them is packed with face cells, but each is representing faces in different ways. We also showed that these face areas are directly connected to each other. The strongest connections of any face area are the connections to the other face areas, not to nearby areas with different tuning properties, but to the other face processing areas. So the face areas are forming a face processing network. I, now you have division of labor, different kinds of representations within this network. What this means is the strongest effect on any face area is from the other face areas. So we can think of these different representations as transformations of each other. That greatly, greatly simplifies the way you can think about the system. And it's a gift of nature, if you will, that the things are organized that precisely and that beautifully. So we can now talk about the representation in AL, and I will come back to this in a second, um, showing this mirror symmetry as a result of a transformation of inputs from the middle face areas that lack this property. And we have to ask, like, how can we explain it? There are different processes likely supported by these different areas. I talked about face detection being supported by the middle face area. And then with two transformations, we now have a code that is more vertical to who is in the image than to what is in the image you know, on a feature-based um, basis. Um, the code becomes more invariant to in-depth rotation, which is a non-affine transformation. And it becomes more vertical to who is in the image, which you can think of as an inference. Um, something that is not directly in the image, but something that you have to infer from the image. So this gets us to another point that was uh, addressed in the psychophysical study that I was trying um, not very successfully on you guys in the first attempt. So in the psychophysical study, the main point the authors uh, wanted to make was about the importance of familiarity with people on face recognition. So I know these two people, they're the authors or two of the authors of this paper personally. So it's very easy for me to tell these different uh, pictures apart. And it's much harder if you don't know these, these people in person. What they did in, this, in their study, in the psychophysical study was a very clever test. They used pictures, not of themselves, but of two Dutch celebrities. And when they showed these pictures of these Dutch celebrities um, to British participants, the British participants estimated much larger numbers of people being in these images. Again, the mode was 7.5. Uh, when they showed it to Dutch participants, every single one of them got it exactly right and said there are two people in there. So there's a huge difference between our ability to recognize people in general, to discriminate between them based on the physical properties on their face, and our ability to really recognize people, which means that we're now forming a relationship with knowledge, with prior memory that we have of these people and the incoming sensory information. So if you've seen The Godfather, you might remember the names of the characters. This is person recognition. It is so closely tied to face um, perception that it's sometimes even difficult to appreciate that there's a difference. But think about it that you can recognize a person also based on the voice or you know based on the name. So it doesn't just have to be faces, but faces are a very powerful way for you to recognize a person. And again, it's not a conscious, effortful um, process. It is something that happens automatically and then it's, it's just there and you become conscious of it afterwards. So person recognition is different. And so we're interested in, is that something that the face processing network that I showed you before is also supporting? And the student who asked this question was Sophia Landi, who's now uh, posted in a different lab, but was a fantastic grad student. And her study really started by doing the same experiment uh, that we've done before, contrasting activity to faces with activity to non-face objects, but now replacing the faces, generic faces with familiar faces to the subject monkeys that she was studying. So it's not the picture of Charles Darwin. And for the object, it was not uh, the Sydney Opera House, but it was um, pictures of individuals that the subjects were highly, highly familiar with, that they lived with together for several years and of toys that they were equally highly familiar with. So in her fMRI experiment, Sophia found the very same face errors that I've shown to you before. But in addition, 
she found two phase errors that we had not seen before. One is uh, called here TP because it's located in a part of the brain called the temporal pole. It's very anterior in the temporal lobe. It's a region that's not much studied because it's actually very difficult to get access to. And also with imaging, it's easy to miss because the artifacts are bigger there. And the second region in perirhinal cortex that we call PR. So the fact that we see these areas in, you know, for a contrast of familiar faces versus non-familiar faces is a first indication that maybe these areas are particularly sensitive to familiar items, but it's really not proof of it. So Sophia ran a second experiment um, that I would also like to try on you guys, and um, I'm hoping it's gonna work. So I'm showing you here two images and you're sitting sufficiently far away from the screen to probably be able that even though these images are highly blurred, you will be able to say that these are likely images of faces. So in this paradigm, we are slowly over the course of 32 seconds unblurring an image, adding more and more high spatial frequency content to it. And I will start doing this now on the left-hand side. And very likely at some moment in time, before really all of the facial detail is shown, you will be able to recognize this person. You will have this moment of recognition and you will say, Obama. You recognize this person and I hope that this has happened for all of you. Again, the experiment continues. We're gonna be adding more and more detail to it. You've had this moment of recognition. As I mentioned early on, in familiar face recognition, you were able to recognize a face even without access to detailed fine grain spatial information, just based on the gist of the face. Okay, let's do this one more time for the face on the right hand side. We're adding more and more detail to it. It's the same process as we did for the face on the left hand side. And hopefully this moment of recognition will never happen to any of you because you are not familiar with this person on the right hand side. It's the half brother uh, of Obama who is far less famous and far less well known than his brother. So yes, you get more and more detail, you know, you see his face better and better, but you will never recognize him because there's no memory content um, that you could link this perceptual information to. So why am I doing this? What is the logic of this paradigm? Well, imagine you have an area that is really interested in faces in general, and you're now adding more and more detail to it. You could imagine that activity in this brain area would increase, maybe not exactly linearly, but roughly linearly over time as getting more and more information. And it wouldn't really matter whether it's a familiar face or a non-familiar face. But an area that was sensitive to the recognition of familiar individual might show a sigmoidal increase of activity around the time of recognition. So, you know, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Now you recognize the person, activity surges, and then roughly stays on that level. You could also imagine combinations of these two things, but this is the core logic, that some kind of nonlinearity in response would be an indication for an area to be selective for familiar faces. So the fMRI results that Sophia got are rich, um, I'm showing the two main findings that she got. So inside the face processing network that I've talked about so far, she finds this pretty linear increase of activity as there's more and more information added to the face. It's a slightly bigger response inside the system to familiar than to unfamiliar faces, but it's pretty much linear for both of them. But in the two new areas that she discovered, TP and PR, she finds a very different pattern of responses. It's very, very clear in TP, you find this nonlinear increase of response and you find it only for the familiar faces and not for the unfamiliar faces. Similar pattern of results in PR, the perirhinal area, there is a bit of a response to non-familiar faces, but it's roughly linear and much weaker than the response to familiar faces. In TP, the temporal pole area, it's very, very clear. So more recently then Sophia did what every self-respecting member of my lab does. 
uh, record from the area uh, that she discovered. We focused on TP um, because you know the responses there uh, are so clear. And what she found, and I'm sorry, I put the electrode here to the wrong area. This is this is from TP. Um, she finds that this area is number one is highly selective to familiar monkey faces. So um, you see here the response to all of the familiar monkey faces in red. Uh, this is the population average. You see a response to unfamiliar monkey faces, which initially give very similar responses. So you can imagine it takes a bit of time for the system to be able to tell, you know, whether this is a familiar individual or not. And all the other stimuli, including human faces and familiar non-familiar objects, they give much, much bigger responses. So this area really cares a lot about two things. One, is it a monkey face or not a monkey face? And the other thing, it's a familiar monkey face or non familiar monkey face. And again, like from the timing here, you might tell that maybe this area is also performing a visual analysis and needing some time to be able to tell whether a picture of a monkey face is of a familiar one or not. Let's look at an individual example cell. It's a beautiful cell that is really responding only to one particular stimulus in this whole stimulus set. If I would just tell you these are like different images and wouldn't tell you, you know, what is shown in these images, you would say, oh yeah, this is a very sparsely firing neuron. And there happens to be like one stimulus it's familiar to. It's only when I tell you, okay, it's an image of a familiar individual that you realize this is not your run of the mill, sparse face selective neuron. It's a neuron that very likely is using um, memory information. And again, in the population, we find many of these neurons. We also find other neurons that are not that discriminatory between different familiar individuals, but respond to multiple for me individuals. And so that pattern of results in um, the temporal pole is very similar to that we find in other face ears um, in that some cells respond to some individuals, others more broadly to multiple individuals. But here it is confined A to monkey faces and B to familiar monkey faces. So it responds much more and I, I could give you an entire lecture about this area. Uh, it's very, very clear and very beautiful. Um, what's happening in this, in this region. So we have a third process, person recognition. I should be clear is that we do find signatures of familiarity also inside the, the face processing system. Um, that is bigger responses to familiar faces than to non-familiar ones. It's possible that there are more cells, for example, responding to familiar individuals than to non-familiar ones. But really uh, there's additional circuitry, um, ARSTP and PR uh, that are particularly devoted to the processing of personal, personally familiar individuals. Okay, so these are the main findings that we have. I could show you more, but these are the main findings that we have of the neural circuitry of face processing uh, to this day. So the most important principles here are that we have multiple areas arranged in, or uh, connected to each other in a network, that they are transformations of each other, based on the locations of these areas along the temporal lobe and based on other properties like response latencies and the size of the receptive field, we can infer a hierarchy of processing uh, from ML here to AL to AM, such that we can think of the system as performing two major transformations of a representation here into a second one and into the third one here. This picture is rather different from the one that uh, Charles Gross and David Parrott, who's another pioneer of face uh, cells um, had at, at their time, they found this distributed pattern. They did not identify face cells to be clustered into these areas. Therefore, it was difficult for them to infer the degree of functional specialization that existed uh, between different faces. They had ideas and then David had very clear ideas um, influenced greatly by David Marr and other um, concepts in computer vision about processing hierarchies, but it was not really to identify, really possible to identify clearly which you know, regions would correspond to which stage of processing or even how many transformations there were. So how can we use this advance? How can we make use of this much clearer understanding of the neural machinery of face processing? One of our goals is to identify computational principles. And we work together with Tommy uh, on that first in trying to um, answer the question whether deep processing networks like deep convolutional networks or 
uh, the Max architecture that I'm showing on the right hand side, which I'm sure you've been um, told about many times over, whether these architectures can explain the qualitative picture of selectivities and selectivity progressions that, that we see inside the brain. So can we explain the selectivities we see by a feed forward architecture? And does this architecture need to be deep? You know that the most successful architectures that we have now, they have 36 layers or more, but I'm telling you that the actual neural processing system has only two major transformations. Um, this is not to say that no transformations are happening within uh, cortical areas, but the two main ones that are so obvious, they're right in your face, of those we only see two. And lastly, can we explain the occurrence of mirror symmetry tuning at this mid-level of processing? And I will explain to you now like why I'm a little bit obsessed with this question. The reason I'm obsessed with it is that the occurrence of this mirror symmetry is a telltale sign of, of something rather surprising happening. And this is one way you can convince yourself that it is rather surprising. So assume you have an input layer here with tuning to the, similar to the tuning we find ML, which is head orientation tuned. A cell might be tuned to the left profile or left half profile, front view, and so on and so forth. And now you would use that input to construct a second layer of processing. How would the tuning look like there? Now, most learning rules that you would use to construct the second layer are temporal contiguity learning rules. And when you look at faces in the real world, they move continuously. They don't jump from left to right. If they move from left to right, they move through a view of the front face or a view of the, of the back of the head, um, but they don't jump directly. So if you have a temporal contiguity learning rule, you would expect uh, tuning curves in AL that would look something like this. There should be broader versions than the input, maybe very broad. Maybe they could abstract from head orientation completely, but there should be broader versions and they should respect the physical proximity of actual physical head rotation as a consequence of the temporal contiguity learning. That is what you would expect. What we actually have is something very different that requires a very different wiring scheme leading to this mirror symmetry. So even without thinking about what this mirror symmetry might be good for, you know, like what its adaptive value might be, it tells us something about how the system is wired up and um, how it is not wired up. And therefore it might tell us something about you know, whether hierarchical systems that use these temporal contiguity learning rules on the left-hand side are able to generate them. So this is really work of Joe Leibow, who's a grad student with Tommy. It's now for several years uh, with DeepMind. And the idea of the modeling work that Joel and Tommy did is to construct a modular architecture in the sense that the network would only process faces. And you do this by implementing at level number one, uh, a face filter. So if you have a movie coming into the system, it would uh, respond to the face content, but not respond to the non-face content of this movie. We are also positing something that's very natural for most deep learning systems, um, but also very natural given the properties I showed to you of face area AM, which is very identity selective and not very head orientation selective, that the computational goal of the system is identification, is the discrimination between the physically different faces. And now Joel worked through a large number of different learning rules. And he found that for one particular learning rule and only this one, a regularized version of having learning called Oya's rule, he gets mirror symmetry in processing level number two. Again, only for this learning rule. So what have we learned? Number one is yes, there is a feed forward processing system that does replicate the three qualitative properties that we find in the face processing system. This system is not deep, it only has three levels of processing. So depth is not required to explain these properties. Depth might be required to explain other properties or you know, the performance of the system. But it also tells us something about the principles by which the system is organized. Um, there are local tuning properties that result from the large scale organization, that result from the learning rule, and therefore the way that the system is wired and they result from the stimulus geometry and the computational goal. I did not comment on the, on the stimulus geometry. So what Joel also found is that you only get the mirror symmetry confusion 
for stimuli that are intrinsically mirror symmetric. Again, this is a confusion for the profile views, which are by themselves that the pictures are not mirror symmetric, but they result from a 3D stimulus that has an intrinsic bilateral symmetry. Only when you have stimuli like this will you get this intermediate level mirror symmetric representation. So an observation that seemed rather odd, but was very, very typical for one level of processing can give rise to really deep insights or at least a hypothesis um, based on very fundamental principles of processing that can explain um, our findings. So this is the qualitative picture. What about a quantitative description? So I told you about head orientation tuning, mirror symmetry confusion, and identity selectivity. And we can quantify this in the population by looking at population response similarity matrices. I'm showing this here for um, an experiment that I showed to you in, in the movies before, in which we presented 200 different images consisting of 25 individuals, each shown at eight different head orientations. The matrix is organized coarsely by these head orientations in a systematic fashion. And the fine grained organization is that for every head orientation, we have identities one through 25, one through 25, one through 25, and so on and so forth. These are the entry points of the 200 by 200 population response matrix. I'm showing here the Pearson correlation coefficient of the population response vectors to these 200 different images. Dark entries are indicating strong correlations, i.e. similar responses of the population. In the middle phase patches, the dominant feature of the population response matrix is head orientation. The most similar responses occur to faces of any identity, but of the same head orientation. You can see it also for upwards and downwards tilted faces. These are the black regions for the middle face patches. In AL, we see all those properties as well. But in addition, we see the emergence of other dark regions which are the mirror symmetric versions that we talked about before. Similar responses of the AL population to mirror symmetric versions of a face. And furthermore, you see something that becomes really, really strong in AL, in AM, in the third level of processing. You see these paradiagonal stripes that are equidistant from each other. If you would count, there are 25 entries so far apart from each other. This new feature means that these cells have identity selective information that is invariant to head orientation. We can quantify these three different properties by comparing them to idealized matrices that only contain view specificity, only contain mirror symmetry, and only contain view invariant identity coding. And so we can quantify for our three phase areas, um, you know, what is the contribution of each of these three properties. Why do we do all this quantification? So number one is to have a, a more precise view of, of things that otherwise we can only put words to. But second, because this now allows us to do quantitative comparisons with computational systems. So we can compare MLMF with VGG, um, which was one of the state-of-the-art computational systems. And we can pick from all of the different layers of processing that VGG has, the ones that are most similar to the ones in the brain. And you see on the right-hand side, yes, there's some correspondence, and some differences. So correspondence is head orientation tuning goes down, mirror symmetry appears at the second level of processing, it's not there before. A difference is that identity tuning seems to occur earlier in the computational system than in the brain. So in this work with Ilka Yildirim, um, who's a postdoc with Josh Tenenbaum and me, um, and is now faculty at Yale, we thought we, we should consider other architectures as well. So in your classical convolutional network, you have this feedforward mapping of an observed image onto an identity-based embedding. But I already showed you that in IM, we find more than just an identity-based embedding. We find, uh, inside the face processing system, we find a systematic representation of, um, of uh, facial properties. And so an alternative architecture would be that we are trying to make an inference from the observed image, not on the identity directly, but on the latent variables of a 3D face model that would specify things like shape and texture, and that would allow us together with um, extraneous factors, you know, like the pose of the face and the lighting to reconstruct the image, to really understand why the image is looking the way that it does. 
Again, we have some evidence in the brain that this makes sense. It's a completely different logic. It's a logic of intelligence. Is with this logic, you are able to use an internal causal model to generate images and to explain images that you see. That, that is smart. So if we design a computational system like this, uh, we get now quantifications of the responsibility matrix like this one here that are very, very similar you know, um, to the actual properties that we find in the brain. So what does this tell us? Deep convolutional networks have some similarity to the face processing systems. So they can generate the major properties, but they do not recap recapitulate the, the, the very rapid transitions. They're much more continuous. Um, they also do not provide good quantitative explanations. Instead, we might consider the, the computational goal of the system is really, really important to understand what is going on. We often assume that the computation goal is just identification, but here we're saying it's actually something different. It's the inference of all the latent variables and also of post information. If we do this, we get a much better understanding and this analysis by synthesis approach therefore might be fruitful to explain information processing in inferior temporal cortex in general. So here again is the logic of this, of this system. There's other evidence that we have in favor of this. And um, since I'm coming to the end of my talk now, I will just give you like an intuition for it. And this intuition is from a nice illusion of face processing called the hollow face illusion. What you see here is, uh, or appears to be um, uh, Albert Einstein's face. And you see it as facing towards you and we're not gonna set it into motion. So it appears to be uh, moving to your left hand side. And you realize now something weird is happening. You actually did not look at this uh, at the space from the front, but from the back. So you see now it rotating to the right. Now you're looking at the back of this masking and now it, the face is popping forward. I hope that you all experienced this, is that even though you know that you're looking into the hollow background of this face, you see it as, as forward facing. So this is what would happen if in your brain there was an internal causal model that is a 3D face model that would interpret this incoming set of images to the two eyes uh, of yours and would override the actual interpretation of you looking into uh, the concave part of a mask, just as the face processing system is overriding you know, the information that this is a pepper and tells you it's a face, it's now telling you it's a face, therefore it has to be facing forward. So the main points I want to make to you is that in the brain of macaque monkeys, but also in humans to the extent that we know, there is an intricate machinery dedicated to the processing of faces. It consists of multiple areas wired together as beautiful properties that allow us to, to really get a detailed qualitative and quantitative understanding of the system and to extract computational principles for detection, discrimination, and recognition. We have an understanding that is so detailed that we can now make computational models that go beyond you know, simple you know, correlations that did exist, um, but are really identifying mechanisms and computational principles. And now we are favoring an interpretation where the system actually allows you to get more from the image than what is really there. If you see a picture, you know, of Audrey Hepburn, you don't just see like a two-dimensional, you know, set of pixels, pixels, but you're inferring something three-dimensional that is literally not there. How can you do it? Because you have richly structured priors in this part of your brain. So coming back to the initial questions, what is it about our brains that makes us think the way we do? I try to answer that question for a particular part of your brain that is dealing with faces and try to argue that, you know, there's modularity in the brain, that there are these specialized circuits, and that these specialized circuits are implementing specific and smart computational principles um, that are shaping that the way that you're perceiving and interpreting the world. Just very briefly, I want to say that we discovered other networks for other properties as well, mostly in the domain of social cognition, but also outside. So just as there is a network for face perception, I already said that there are two areas and maybe more that are linking um, the analysis of faces, the perceptual analysis of faces to the memory of faces or to the knowledge of people. We find areas that are performing uh, social interaction analysis. I told you initially, this is the second level of understanding of the social world. 
the primates have. Um, there are areas in very different parts of the brain that are selectively activated by the analysis of social interactions. Um, we also find areas that become active when the subject itself is engaged in a social interaction. So it's not observing others engage in a social interaction, but it's engaged itself. Uh, there's a whole network for the generation of facial movements, communicative gestures, and there's a network of attentional control that is in, in linked to um, the social processing areas in interesting ways. So thank you very much for your attention.